So let's begin speaking about the Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela. As I told you before on the first slide, this is the place where we have some of the largest flowering of polyphony in the medieval period, especially the earlier period, the 12th century. The Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela is literally translated as St. James in the Field of the Star. Sant Iago. Iago is the Latinized version of James. This particular cathedral is in the region of Aquitaine, which, by the way, also is the troubadour center of the universe. It's also connected with Provence and northwestern Spain. And this graphic I'm showing you is actually Sant Iago himself, St. James himself, offering a blessing. This is taken directly out of one of the manuscripts that is connected with Santiago de Compostela. This cathedral itself was one of the huge medieval tourist attractions. It was almost like a medieval Disneyland because religion was such a part of life at this time. The monks at the cathedral very shrewdly published a guidebook, almost like a tour guidebook, and it was a very detailed guidebook. It spoke of how one should go on a journey from Paris to Santiago and places one should stop, and there was an innkeeper that had this great wine, so very, uh, very personable sort of guide. Guidebook. And eventually the guidebook, there are many copies of these, one of them makes its way into a well-known codex, the Codex Calixtinus. So what the heck is a codex? A codex is Latin for a block of wood or a book. The plural is codices. So what for our purposes this is, is a handwritten book in general, one produced between late antiquity and the Middle Ages. And Calixtinus, the last part of that codex, means that it was attributed or created for Pope Calixtus. This codex had some very important things inside of it. It contained illuminations of a pilgrimage from Santiago to Paris. And of course, this lovely illumination I'm showing you of Santiago himself. A list of the relics of Santiago, which supposedly included the foot of St. James. The tourist guidebook that the monks had written. And for our purposes, the most important part was the inclusion of polyphony, which was in two independent voices, probably having some Spanish influences, and there may have even been the influence of Mozarabic chant in here as well, even though, of course, that's supposed to be extinct by now. Most pieces were probably copied in France and written for the Cathedral of Santiago itself. Because this repertory is composed in southern France and in the region called Aquitaine, we now refer to it as Aquitanian polyphony. Continuing now with Aquitanian polyphony, gentlemen and ladies, the graphic I have here is again to show you that this is generally what they were seeing in terms of notation of this polyphony, so it was still rather unclear as to how one should put it into modern notation. But you can see there are some indications of up and down lines, and there actually is a staff here, believe it or not, although it's rather hard to see few examples of early organisms. So the way that Aquitanian polyphony was constructed. First of all, we have the chant. The original chant, whatever that was, was put into the vox principalis, the principal voice. In this case, they had those notes drawn out in very long values. And then on top of that, they put, again, the vox organalis, the new voice, just as from Musica and Chiriadis, is created anew and has several notes against that chant. So a good example of this to look at in your anthologies, ladies and gentlemen, is on page 63, Jubilemus Exultemus. And you can see very clearly that the lower voice has longer note values and is held for much longer and the upper voice has this very florid upper line which is sung against those long drawn out note values. I highly encourage you to listen to this. This is CD1, track 63. Eventually this style of Aquitanian polyphony becomes later in, in the 13th century what we call florid organum, and I'll explain more about that in a moment. So many pieces in this collection that were in Santiago de Compostela were liturgical tropes which had polyphony added. And then others were very specific to what is called the Cult of St. James, so a group of Christians that really centered around James as an actual figure. In fact, Santiago de Compostela, St. James in the Field of the Star, is constructed because of a myth that St. James was walking through the same field and saw a falling star and God telling him to build a cathedral here. So very large mythological component to some of these early Christian figures. 
In terms of the music, we don't have any real rhythmic values that are indicated in Aquitanian polyphony, but sort of a sense of when we're to arrive on certain notes, again, based on the Latin. The interpretation, as you can see from this notation, would be widely varied. Intervals are often quite different. One of the other interesting changes at this time is that the new voice, the vox organalis, is now usually written on top of the vox principalis, so the voice which carries the chant. Before this, the chant had its polyphonies written sort of inconsistently. They could cross over and under the principal voice. And an example of that is in your nom texts, Alleluia, Justus ut palma, on page 61. So in this you can see that we have soloists who cross over and under the chant line and actually in this particular example we have organum which is note against note rather than what we saw with the Aquitanian polyphony which is long drawn out note values and a florid voice on top. This is more note against note. That top voice, the, the organal voice, could really go over and under and all around the chant voice. But now the way that composers after Aquitaine are starting to view organum is that the chant is the foundational voice and polyphony should always be written above. This way of composing influences music through the age of the Renaissance. The lowest voice, usually containing the chant in the medieval period, is called the tenor. And again, that's Latin for the word tenere, which means to hold, so that held the chant. And the upper voice, after Aquitaine again, usually sings a melismatic line above the lower voice, the tenor, and almost always has twice as many notes. So as I said, this is later called florid organum. And in contrast, organum, like what you see on page 61 in your nom texts, which moved note against note, was referred to as discantus, or discant organum. At the end of the 12th century, we have a really dramatic war which occurs called the Albigensian Crusade. It's all based upon Christians fighting other Christians. How wonderful. And the troubadour culture moves north. The biggest center for polyphony then changes to Paris. Incidentally, I definitely recommend that you listen to Alleluia Justus ut Palma from Ad Organum Faciendum on page 61. Depending on what set of CDs you purchased with your anthology, it should be on CD1, track 51, or CD1, track 17. So now we'll be discussing what is called Notre Dame polyphony, which occurs in the late 12th, early 13th centuries. And in order to explain how that comes about, I want to give you guys some more historical background about this time period. In the 12th century, or the 1100s in Europe, there are a lot of things that begin to come together for the first time and provide unity for many of the people living there. One of them is the Crusades, believe it or not. The Crusades of the Christians to go into the Holy Land and win it back from the Muslims. In a lot of ways, this is a well-orchestrated attempt to distract the monarchy and the dukedoms, all the ruling powers, from problems at home, which of course include crop, famine, taxes that are due, etc., to problems outside, which is conquering the Holy Lands from the Muslims. So there's a uniting cause between people for the first time. Also, the Byzantine Empire is another one of the important things which adds unity to the West. This empire, of course, calls the attention of Western Europe to the Middle East. They are the ones who ask for help because they are afraid of being overrun by the Muslims. The Byzantines are a very rich remnant of the Roman Empire. They are Christian, sophisticated, and cultured, far more so than the Western Europeans, who are still at this point mostly barbarians and loosely knit groups of people loyal to one lord. Also, the Great Schism of 1054 occurred, and this provided further stratification and also unity among certain groups. Originally, Christianity was a unified religion, while the East was richer than the West. But the Great Schism, or the Great Split, involved the acceptance of the Trinity by the Western Christians and the rejection of it by the Eastern Christians. The Western Christians demonstrated in the Credo that they believed Christ existed with God from the beginning of time. And there's a lot of effort that's spent to link the Credo with the Trinity. 
The Eastern Christians did not accept this because they believed that since Christ was a man, he could not also be part of God. So therefore they had a fracture or a schism over this particular belief. And the Western Christians then adopt their church father, who is called the Pope, while the Eastern Christians adopt their church father, called the Patriarch. So now the West begins to have a cultural identity for the first time. Prior to this, they pretty much had nothing on the Muslims and the Byzantines. In Paris and Bologna, we start to see the founding of the first European universities. University is a bit of a wishful thinking term at this time. These universities are a lot more like trade schools, but law is one of the things that they trade in. So Bologna was famous for civic or city law, and Paris was famous for clerical or canonical law, church law. The University of Paris was most definitely connected with what was known as the Paris Cathedral at this time. During this era, it was actually a basilica, which means an extremely old building, probably back to the time of the First Roman Empire. Maurice of Sully, who was the Bishop of Paris in 1160, decided that this basilica was starting to fall down and not as useful as it had been, so he began plans for building a new cathedral of Notre Dame, which means Cathedral of Our Lady. The cathedral takes a century to finish building, but by 1180 they've at least completed enough to consecrate the main altar. And there's actually a great deal of civic pride during this time. Many, many cathedrals are built in this early medieval period because the Westerns, first of all, feel like they have a cultural identity. We also know that polyphony was being sung in Paris at the Cathedral of Notre Dame, which was different than early and Aquitanian polyphony, although it certainly had some things in common with them. So here we are again looking at Léonin's Alléluia, and we'll learn a bit about him now. All of the information we have today about polyphony at Notre Dame does not come from records at Notre Dame, but actually from the notes of an English professor or student who we have called Anonymous IV. And the reason we have called him this is because his treatise is the fourth one that's written during this time and unsigned, so he is the fourth anonymous writer. We believe he was affiliated with Paris University, and he describes the musical life and developments at Paris in this time. His notes date from about the late 12th to the early 13th centuries, and what he tells us is the following. Number one. In the three generations prior to his, meaning Anonymous IV's, taking notes, Léonine, who is probably active from about 1160 to 1190, is the greatest composer of organum, which actually in Latin is called organista. Anonymous IV tells us that Léonine wrote the Magnus Liber Organi, which means the Great Book of Organum. This is a beautifully illuminated piece of work, and in fact this Alleluia you're looking at is from the Magnus Liber Organi. Contains organum for the proper of the Mass. Would have been sung by soloists. In very typical medieval form, Léonin did not sign his name to any of the pieces that he wrote. So we only know that he wrote these pieces because Anonymous IV tells us he wrote them, or at least most of them. The organum that Léonin wrote are essentially two voice settings of responsorial chants written for the greatest feast days of the church here, such as Christmas, Easter, Pentecost, etc. And the chants that are drawn and then set in the Magnus Liber are taken from the Vespers, the matins, so two of the office hours, and then also from the mass, the graduals and alleluia, so that's why we see an alleluia here. Leonin is a diminutive, it literally means small or little Leo. However small he may have been, he was considered a composer who had an extremely powerful impact on music. He almost has the status of a fictional or legendary character because he did this amazing thing of creating organum. Anonymous IV tells us that Leonin was an educated man and was both a poet and a canon, not the kind you fire, but someone who's an expert in church law at Notre Dame. He was also very likely the choir master because he wrote all of this music. He must have been writing it for someone. At this time, there's no formal training of composers in conservatories such as we have today. So most composers, like Leonin, were members of the clergy and composing was just one of the many things that they did in their daily lives. You guys will see that Leonin's music is one step further along the line of Aquitanian polyphony. And during this time, we still have the same two basic choices of kinds of organum to write. Florid organum, which is chant that has long note values in the tenor voice, and then many florid notes against it in the newly composed voice. And discant organum, which is note against note organum that's in a rhythmical framework. Leonin always used these two styles of polyphony when he wrote proper chants for the soloists, and he would often switch back and forth between the two of them. 
another graphic for you guys to take a look at. This is an example of how organum would look in our modern notation. This would be what's called discant organum. As you can see, we have parallel fourths. This is something you're usually told not to do in your theory classes, but this is how the first music was written because it was written before those other rules were examined and decided. We do see that polyphony is being used quite a bit in this time period of Notre Dame. The Magnus Liber alone contains 30 responsories, 20 graduals, and 40 alleluias, so that's about 90 pieces in one collection. Finding only a few pieces here and there to finding nearly a hundred is pretty significant of the trend that polyphony presents. Leonin particularly focused on composing polyphony for the soloist portions of the chant, and he simply left the rest of the Gregorian chant in its regular Gregorian chant formation to be sung by the choir in unison. Within Leonin's music we see alternations between florid organum and discant organum. And a good example of that, if you open your nom text and turn to page 67, you can see Leonin's Viderunt Omnis. And you'll notice that the first page is in entirely what we would call florid organum. And then if you turn the page over to page 68, you'll see there's a section of discant organum, after which there's yet another section of florid organum. So he switches back and forth between these two styles, and I highly encourage you to listen to this piece. As always, if you have the uh, CD that's listed here, it will be track 57 of CD1. And you might wonder to yourself, why does he go back and forth between these two styles of florid organum and discant organum? The reason being, he would look at the original chant, and if the chant was syllabic, that was one note per syllable, he would set that as florid organum because it wouldn't take much time to get through it and he wanted to elaborate it. If, however, he was setting a melismatic chant where there are many, many notes per syllable, he would set that as discant organum because he had to get through several chant notes and putting them into a rhythmic framework will make them go by faster. So with syllabic chant he was trying to make it longer, with melismatic chant he was trying to make it shorter. So. Keeping on with Anonymous 4, the number two important thing that he tells us is that Perotin, who we believe was active from 1180 to 1238, was the greatest composer of discantus, or discant, organum. We think that Perotin was probably at the cathedral choir, may have been one of the soloists, and probably was a student of Leonin's. They're about a generation apart, and Perotin obviously understood the way to write organum from Leonin, so he may have been taught. Perotin is a short or diminutive for little Peter. No jokes there. We also have three main sources from pieces that these two composers wrote, and then also a secondary fourth source. These are scattered all over Europe, and I want you guys to be aware of these because you may see them as graduate students and wonder what the heck this means. So the first one is called W1, was discovered in the city of Wolfenbüttel, where we get the W from, and probably copied in St. Andrew's Priory in Scotland. Second source is W2, also found in Wolfenbüttel. It's often called Wolfenbüttel 1099, has nothing to do with the tax form. This one we believe was copied in France. Third important source is called F for Florence, which we believe was copied in France. And the secondary fourth source is M.A. for Madrid, copied in Toledo, Spain. So again, they don't name them by where they were copied, but where they were then discovered. And these are very common to see in dissertations and also in many important scholarly articles. So just to be aware of these uh, sources will help you in your studies of polyphony. This graphic, ladies and gentlemen, is a representation of Perotin's organum, which as you can see is a bit more complex than the discant and florid organum that Leonin was writing. We will discuss exactly what this is called. We have traced the music that I mentioned in the previous four sources to the time between 1160 and 1225, and this is when we're fairly certain Leonin and Perotin were active. And we're also, as I said, fairly certain that Leonin was succeeded by Perotin, who wrote not only in two voice textures, as his master had, but in three and four part organum. And this is a good example here that you're seeing in this graphic. Perotin would often write his pieces in order to replace pieces that Leonin had written, such as Vida Runt Omnes, and they were often much longer and more complex. So let's take a look at an example of one of these. Perotin also wrote a version of Vida Runt Omnes, which is on page 79 in your anthologies, and again, I highly encourage you to listen to this as well. CD1, track 67 in the older version, and CD1, track 19 in the newer CD version. 
as you guys might be able to see here, Leonin combines discant and florid organum. He takes the long-held tenor of florid organum and against that puts rhythmic upper voices, which are basically discant organum. And he combines these in a style which we call copula style organum. Copula means rooftop, so it literally is written from the rooftop down with all these discant voices. Because the tenor was so important in Perrotin's music, when the lowest note changes, you will find that that's a very big harmonic moment. And you will also find that these chords, as you listen, sound very, very jazzy in certain places. Perrotin's independence of voices is also fairly unique for this time period. You'll see him in the discant voices using contrary, oblique, and similar motion, as well as what the Germans called Stimmtausch, which means voice exchange. And let's look at an example of that together. If you look in measures 10 and what they're calling 11, looking at the second voice down and third voice down, there is a melodic theme that occurs. <coughs> And another one that occurs. And if you look at that, you can see that, in fact, the second voice has the second melody that I sang first, and then exchanges it with the third voice, so that they sing the same material just at different moments. It's an actual literal diagonal voice exchange. Perrotin also wrote in the three voice genres of the conductus the clausula, and the motet. And these are terms that I will discuss in an upcoming lecture, but not just yet. I just want you to have heard them at this point. Periton sets important texts for special occasions as opposed to regular occurrences. So this kind of elaborate polyphony would have been used for Easter Sundays, Christmas Sundays, very special Sundays in the church. And it again lines up with the idea that polyphony is reserved for special occasions and solo singers. In the 13th century, we have an explosion of writings about music. Of course, there have been little dits and dots uh, on the screen here and there, but this is a really big, big moment for music as a genre and as an art. Much of the writing dealt with musica ficta. Again, we remember that is fictitious music, music which is outside the Guidonian hand. Normally, it would include B flat which was either soft or flat or natural or hard. The general idea was that during this time singers added ficta on their own. They were not allowed to mark up their music like we are today because the rarity of paper. Singers may not have also been afraid of tritones as many people suppose. Tritones we know happen on occasion because there are complaints about when they do in performance. And seconds also happened on occasion. During this Notre Dame era we have the consolidation of steady consonances which is a really big deal because it tells us what was pleasant to people's ear at this time. So the favorite consonances as you can pretty much tell from organum are the fourth, the fifth, and the octave. Again the same intervals that were so admired by Pythagoras. These were referred to as perfect consonances. The imperfect consonances were the thirds and the sixths, which is very odd considering our system today where thirds and sixths are so much a part of chord stacks. So we believe it also had to do with the tuning in this time, which was Pythagorean tuning and quarter comma mean tone, which means that fourths and fifths are really in tune and almost so in tune they make your teeth hurt, whereas thirds and sixths are very flat sounding. There's still a concept in this time of perfection and imperfection. Based on this premise and the combination of perfection with the trinity, perfect equals three units and imperfect equals two units in terms of rhythm. One of the greatest inventions of the Notre Dame school is the invention of the rhythmic modes, and that's what your graphic on this slide is about. These are first mentioned by Anonymous Four in his treatise, and really haven't been spoken about anyone else before this. St. Augustine spoke in broad terms about rhythm. However, this is the first time it's sort of mentioned specifically and quantified. The modes are based on a simple principle, the unit of rhythm as divided into units of three, of a perfection, as they would have called it. Modal rhythms develop around 1280 and they're ideal in theory but not in practice because combinations thereof can be repetitive and boring and you are restricted to dotted quarter and three eighth note patterns. 
Other practical elements such as tempo are not really discussed, although later it is talked about in terms of relating it to a heartbeat. We also think that this use of triple meter was very common because of the use of Latin poetry at this time. Many Latin poems are based upon long, short rhythmic divisions, and this may have been another reason for triple divisions. You can normally tell what's supposed to happen if you look at the transcript and the text, what the note values are in context of the phrase. So we have six rhythmic modes, and you can see what each of them are in the graphic. So quarter eighth, quarter eighth is mode one, and the reverse is mode two. Mode three is a little more complex, and mode four is also around the same, just with the orders reversed. Mode five is two dotted quarters, and mode six is three eighths. I want to be very clear that the rhythmic modes have nothing to do with the church modes. They are two totally separate things. You could think of a mode at this time as a codification and organization of something. In this case, it happens to be rhythm. Thank you for listening to this lecture, and we will continue learning more about medieval music in the next week.